Okay. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the second day of the session. Uh, today, we're going to start off uh, with a, a lecture on marginal productivity of debt, which is given by me. Uh, then, it, the second morning session is the marginal object and marginal subject by Professor. And in the afternoon, we have Keith with From Price to Spread and Human Action is Arbitrage. Um, so, marginal productivity of debt. Now, marginal productivity of debt is in the similar line to what we were examining yesterday. Marginal productivity of labor and marginal productivity of capital. And we had to have a particular refinement, remember, for marginal productivity of capital. You look to define what that level, that level is. You looked at the change in the output versus the cost applied to, to get that marginal unit. And that gives you your marginal productivity of capital. So we can extend this concept quite easily uh, to debt and to credit. Uh, so just a bit about what every what these metrics are. GDP this is defined to equal uh, consumption plus uh, investment plus government expenditure plus um, exports minus imports. And supposedly this is a useful measure um, about how well an economy is doing. And if it's going up, uh, the economy is doing well, and vice versa. Um, and if you stop and think about it, there isn't really anything in here which would, in my mind, point to, if it were rising, a good economy. I mean, consumption going up, private investment going up maybe is something. Consumption and government expenditure um, not really relevant measures in my books to anything. But anyway, this is what is used and accordingly I'll have to use it as well. So um, GDP, uh, you should think of this um, uh, as a stream, an annual stream. And the government takes a percentage, uh, a percentage of that every year, hopefully, in the form of tax, tax revenue. And an interesting thing to observe is the percentage of GDP that is taken in tax revenue. And you see that that does vary quite a lot during the cycle. So GDP is a, uh, it's like a stream, okay, an annual stream, an annual payment or annual flow in the most abstract sense of not something very useful. Um, okay, so we've got the definition of GDP. And we have uh, the definition of debt. And debt is just the, an obligation to pay money. Um, not going into the difference between a bill and a bond, obviously a bill is an obligation to pay money as well, but for this particular type of obligation I'm talking about obligations that were incurred in the building of property and plant, debt that isn't liquidated by selling the underlying venture or selling whatever the debt was used to create, not self-liquidating. Okay, so an obligation to pay to pay money. So debt, aggregate debt outstanding 
whether you look at it at, uh, sort of from a personal government, whatever level, um, it's not a stream. Okay, it's it's not a stream, and. GDP, in the most abstract sense, is a stream. So, looking at aggregate debt to GDP as a ratio, you're not comparing um, apples, apples with apples. It doesn't mean anything. Debt to GDP doesn't tell you anything very, very useful. And debt, debt to GDP is the metric that everyone quotes. You know, our debt to GDP ratio is under 100 or under 80. So the previous all time high was whatever it was, 110. So everything is all right. You know, the economy can handle more debt. It handled more debt as a percentage in the past. So everything is okay. We can carry on monetizing and, and doing what we're doing. Um, but they're looking at the, uh, the, wrong, the wrong measure. They're looking at the wrong measure. And as I said, we have to go back to marginality to actually look at the correct measure. Now, I'm sorry that my presentation isn't up on the, uh, the screen, but you've got the charts in the lecture notes, just not in color. So this is lecture four. Um, Page eight. So, in that first chart in the top left hand corner, I have um, nominal debt outstanding um, across government, uh, consumer, mortgage, and corporate. And you can see that it's, for want of a few periods, pretty much monotonically increasing since 1975. And the dashed line shows uh, GDP. And you can see that it's been pretty much trailing the, the movement in the debt there. So from first impressions, it looks like more debt is good for the GDP and the economy. Uh, also inductive economics, I'd say. Um, but it's not. So, what we look at is marginal productivity of debt. And that's defined as the uh, change in GDP nominal divided by change in uh, debt outstanding, all nominal. Okay. So this is a better measure. First of all, you're, you're looking at a correct, you're looking at the change in GDP, which is, which is more akin, yeah. Debt outstanding, total debt? Total debt. Total. So consumer plus mortgage plus corporate plus <laughs> government, yeah. Um, so this, with this measure, you're, 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 first of all, you're being more accurate in terms of the in integrity of what you're comparing. Uh, but more importantly, it tells you something much more um, about uh, what debt can do at the margin in an economy on its own to, let, uh, uh, to uh, make the economy grow or contract, as it were. So in a similar way, when you look at the change in one unit factory for the total output of whatever, you're doing the same thing here, changing the debt by one unit, as it were, and looking how the total output of the economic system changes because of that. Now, 
Obviously, debt is not the only factor in an economy. If you think about an economic system, debt is only one variable. But the contention is that if you look at that chart there, um, with nominal debt outstanding, that I would say that debt is the major driver behind GDP growth. The growth in debt, rather than change in productivity, is behind the change in nominal GDP. And that seems to be borne out with the chart there. So basically, marginal, marginal productivity of debt um, tells you how much extra output you have for a $1 increase in the nominal debt outstanding. And um, it's not looking good. Not looking good at all. And you mentioned zero, one. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, typically um, you want the number to be positive. So and greater than one. And, and, and greater than one. It doesn't need to be, but um, if it's greater than one, it means that every dollar of incremental debt gives one dollar more in GDP. It makes sense. Makes sense. And that would mean that you would, or uh, one would, take on more debt, all other things being equal, because it will have a marginal impact. So anything above one is good. Anything below one means that um, you'll be out, the outlay of debt of a dollar will give back less than a dollar in nominal growth. Which again, it's not bad. It's certainly better than... Well, it's, it's bad, actually. Because why, why make the investment? Well, if, if the you don't get back... Well, it's true. That is true. You shouldn't really do it under one, you know. Uh, but that doesn't stop people, I think. No, 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 why? No. It can be worse. It can be worse. And obviously, if it's negative, that means that <laughs> you, uh, the, any incremental increase in debt is going to lead to a contraction in output. And that is bad. Very, very bad. And that's where we are now. That's where we are now. So if you look at how this has um, changed throughout the decades, Um, so let's start um, end of World War II um, to present. Now you all have a chart here in the in the notes uh, from 1975, and I did that by scratch. So if you want to create that yourself. All you do is you add up the uh, corporate debt, mortgage debt, consumer debt, and government debt outstanding. Uh, and then you look at incremental changes in that as does a ratio. Does that include um, student loan debt? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I didn't explicitly put it in. Is that included in consumer, would you think? I imagine if it was, if it, was it would be, yeah. Because that's, that's just past a trillion dollars in the U.S. recently. Yeah. The student loan bubble. My goodness. Very sobering moment. Mm. So, um, you can all do that. You can get that data from your Bloomberg or from the Fed website. And it would be a good idea to do it for all the other countries as well. I didn't have time. So, in the, in, at the end of World War II, this ratio was about three. And uh, allowing for some leads and lags, by 19, 1975, we're at uh, 1.5, or thereabouts. And come 2006 was the first time that we went uh, negative. It's really the moving average which is... Uh, yeah, I've got the raw data there and a four-quarter moving average as well. So if you, if you just look at the raw data, you'll see far too many spikes and... There's a lot of noise. A lot of noise, a lot of noise. 
Um, so you should really look at some kind of um, average over it. But it will tell you pretty much the, uh, the same story. Well, different uh, analysts come up with different yeah. uh, results. Yeah. There are some who say that will go negative sometime in the future. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think there's any point, you know, to bicker about yeah. this because the trend is so obvious, it's yeah. jumping off the chart. I mean, whether it's this year or next year, yeah. uh, we are going bad, in a very bad way and nothing is being done, absolutely nothing <coughs> to correct that. So this is a, a crash situation. We are on a train and we can see that the train is going to crash and we are helpless, we are trapped. This is what it is. So it's um, it's not a good uh, not a good picture at all, and um, it says that whatever measure at the margin that's taken involving greater nominal debt outstanding is going to have a detrimental effect uh, to, to total output. And again, this isn't we're trying to make measurements here by observing things with our axiomatic principles. So why the economy changes or how the economy changes because of that incremental piece of debt is not really relevant. You just know that somewhere in the workings it will have a, a very negative uh, impact overall. And if you look at all of the other countries in a similar fashion. The US isn't unique here at all. In fact, <laughs> the US is probably the best in terms of the lack of its rate of decline. And uh, Europe would be a lot, uh, Europe would be a lot worse. So, uh, another thing in favor of America over Europe there. Um, um, I think it's important, you, you have said this, but I think we should emphasize it, that the uh, mainstream economists are looking at the wrong ratio, GDP to debt. Mm. Yeah. That doesn't tell you anything. You are interested in the marginal, what happened at the margin, and that is the real measure. That tells you where you are and where you are going. Mm. I mean, I, I, you can probably understand that um, looking at debt to GDP obviously gives a much better picture than looking at marginal productivity of debt. And you can tamper with and that you can tamper easily. It's, it's much easier to tamper with, uh, with that figure than it is with this figure. But um, I'm pretty sure that they must know about this. Oh, it's a smoke <laughs> screen. Oh, yeah, they are, they are doing it on purpose, just like yeah. the unemployment figures, mm. you know. Mm. They are tampering with it to make uh, people out there happy that mm. it's, we are going in the right direction, mm. but we are not. So it's, it's not a good sign. And if you look at the, the last chart um, in the presentation there, I've got just government debt outstanding as a percentage of total debt. Funded. Funded, yeah. So these are, the, these are only the uh, liabilities which they've recognized. <laughs> and um, you can see that... It's all-time high. All-time high. And uh, it peaked in, at the end of the recession in the 90s. Uh, went from 41% of total debt to 31% of total debt, and from there we've gone from 31 to 40, 43, in all time. The big drop was due to the increase in uh, private... I have a, yes, yes. Private. Relative increase in private. Yeah, yeah. So mid, mid to late 90s you had uh, the huge growth in uh, personal 
consumer debt. This was definitely not a decrease in government. Yeah, I was going to say, if I can interject one thing, they claimed at the end of the Clinton administration that the government had a surplus. Yeah. <laughs> now, in the United States, the law for any private company is if you have more than $5 million in annual revenue, you must use the accrual basis of accounting. Any really small mom and pop you know, pizza restaurant can use cash basis. Mm -hmm. Anything real has to use accrual basis. What basis does the government use? Cash, cash basis. <laughs> Any private company that reported its books the way the government does, the officers would be in prison. <laughs> and so on the accrual basis, there's no question that first of all, the absolute numbers are much higher. Mm. I think the marginal productivity of debt is already way negative on the accrual basis. And there are huge unfunded liabilities to uh, Louis' point in the United States. Social Security and Medicare are estimated I've seen numbers between 80 trillion and 180 trillion just for Social Security and Medicare. Now, the government has also taken on the obligations of, of Fannie and Freddie, which I think had another five or six trillion. You know, so there's, there's trillions here and trillions there, but that number is surely much, 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 much bigger than what they admit to. Mm -hmm. that, that's all true, uh, but I think it's particularly important to look at just the U.S. Treasuries um, because, because of the role U.S. Treasuries play in investment portfolios. You know, the investment community, the professionals, regard U.S. Treasuries as risk-free. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it that mentioned, was it you, Rudy, that, uh, well, anyway, companies that are selling fast-moving consumable goods. Uh, there are about seven or eight of them in the States that have a higher credit rating than the government of the United States. Yeah, to ensure a credit default yes. uh, is lower rate for McDonald's and some of the countries than for the US government. I wonder why. So I think that turns the Chicago School of Capital asset pricing model on its head. But nevertheless, you know, if you take the industry as a whole, the fund managers, the uh, financial analysts, they, when they construct portfolios for clients and give advice on how to invest, the most risk-less, they even call it risk-free, mm -hmm. is treasury bills. Treasury bills. U.S. treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. It's not McDonald's credit. I mean, the market is right. Yeah. The industry. Industries, itself, yes. Is way out of time. Yes. They're following the rules, aren't they? <laughs> Who sets the rules? Okay, so. They all act together as one big herd. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's just one more. Sir. Sure. Uh, you see, the bottom line is that we are not saying that that is bad per se. Mm. It's not. Look at the. After World War II, a ratio of three. That means that wealth was created, and that played a positive and important role. And a lot of the prosperity and uh, increase in longevity, uh, the general health level, and so on, was because of that. Without <clears throat> investment, it wouldn't have happened or would have happened much more slowly. So that that is not bad per se. What is bad <laughs> is this trend which kills the uh, whatever benefit. But that is very much like nuclear power. <laughs> it can be constructive, can be put to good uses, but if you reach the threshold, then chain reaction takes place and there's an explosion and it wipes out uh, uh, cities and even continents. We are approaching that. This is, I think it's a good metaphor, a nuclear explosion. There will be a chain reaction here. All this debt will just explode because the marginal productivity is going negative, which is like self 
destruction. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, I'd like to emphasize that as well. Debt is not is not bad, and if you think three is a good ratio, I. If you see a chart from 1600 or so, I think <laughs> you'll be you'll be surprised with even three. So you you did get double digits um, in the good old days. When the uh, prescription against that mm. was lifted, because mm. remember during the Middle Ages and yes. even the early Renaissance, uh, the, the, there was. Uh, canonic, which means church yeah. prescription against what they called usury, but all that was considered usurious unless it was interest free, nobody would lend you money. But it wasn't just the church, because uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the authorities, the government, also subscribe to the same dogma. And then, as a, partially as a result of the Reformation, this ban was lifted. And there was a market for bonds. And th that was the thing you are talking about, double digit marginal productivity. Fantastic uh, advancement in welfare, in economic conditions, productivity, everything, because of this. And then what happened? 1913, the Federal Reserve, and uh, then uh, the government had to introduce welfare because of the unemployment in the Great Depression and so on, and that's the result. Okay. Terrible, terrible thing. Let's just stop and take five minutes just to think about what a bond is, okay? Because there's a, there was a saying in the City of London that, does anyone know what it is involving a bond? My word is my bond. Is my bond. Okay. Oh my now, <laughs> not not. And sometimes a handshake. Yes. Sometimes exactly. And that intention is 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 has been completely forgotten. Okay. If you've given someone money uh, for the construction of an enterprise and the debt has been acknowledged, that a bond has been created between you and that person. Okay. So. Usually one would expect that you know that person or you have some familiarity of um, what he's doing. Um, and the person on the other end of that side, on the other end of that transaction would naturally be the same. So the concept of having a, a, a debt market where my bond between you, me and Louis has now been transferred to a bond between me and Rudy well, who the hell is Rudy? I know Rudy. Okay, I'm just making the point. Okay, it's been completely washed away. The intention of what a bond is. Okay, in India, you don't have. If you want, if one bank wants to sell a bond to another bank, they basically need to get permission from the president because of, of India. Of India. Because it implies, it implies some, why do you want to get it off your book? <laughs> you know, the, uh, why did you grant the loan in the first place? So that philosophy is still very prevalent um, in India. But then you go, uh, I'm not saying India doesn't have problems, it has huge problems. But if you go further west, the concept of a, an active debt market flowing every day to trillions and trillions of dollars from bank A to bank B to C back to A again. That is a part of modern day business here, just shuffling it around. And that's wrong. That doesn't encourage uh, the correct practice of taking on debt or the correct usage of taking on debt. If you've, got a sec if you've got a bid for your bond at all moments 
as the uh, Federal Reserve does for treasuries, you know, then you, you, you don't worry, per se, because you can always pass the buck to some other greater fool. So the whole, the whole thing is, is, the whole setup is just geared not to be, um, not to be proper. So my word is my bond, that was thrown out of the window a long time ago. Now it's this piece of paper is a bond, and I can rediscount it at the Fed whenever I want. You can say that a government bond put the government into bondage to the individual. And now it's just the opposite. Yeah. The bond puts people into bondage. Yeah. And it's the superior instrument, mm -hmm. they say. And that's what they teach at university. Mm -hmm. Just the opposite of what it should be. It really is. I know we have some economics, economics undergraduates here, but I think that marginal productivity of debt is, is not on the, uh, the loop. You know. So 